like the perfect weather. So we will be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are on their way to state fair today or any other sort of adventure um, that their time be filling and good for their spirits as much as our fellowship together with one another is good for ours. Um, no announcements pertaining to the service today other than I am so happy you are here and welcome to worship. Welcome to worship those of you who are worshiping with us online. As we begin our service, we begin with a centering song, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling. We will stand while we are singing the closing verse.
holy trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sin, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We turn to our Kyrie setting eight. We will sing verses three and four. says the Lord, and not a God far off. Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart. They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams, that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 82 responsibly. God stands to charge the divine council assembled, giving judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. 
They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are God, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals, and fall like any prince. Rise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. Our second reading is from Hebrews. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea, as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who thought, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raising fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we sing our gospel acclamation, um, first service was outside. And um, if you noticed as you came in, there's this nice cloud cover. And so I would like to invite you to embrace the visual outside. Uh, if you need to, you can go peek outside and then come back. <laughs> if you were just so focused on the road, because that's where you should be when driving, and you miss the beautiful cloud cover, I want you to imagine that the clouds that are hanging above us today is like a weighted blanket for the soul. Weighted blankets are those, if you haven't had the pleasure of encountering one, it's um, a stress and anxiety de decompressor. It's just a nice weight on your chest. So I want you to imagine that cloud of witnesses that our Hebrews reading talks about is just covering our spirits and our hearts as we go forth into the gospel today. I'll invite you to rise as you are able. Join us for our gospel acclamation, which is found on page 188 in the front of the hymnal. with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. 
From now on, five in one household, we will be divided. Three against two, and two against three, they will be divided. Father and son, son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Please be seated. So you can go ahead and tug that great cloud of witnesses, weighted blanket around your souls a little bit. If we're going to talk about epic division and conflict, I think we should start by talking about duels. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with the concept of duels? Any other um, history movie fans here? Well. Uh, in case we have anyone watching online who's not familiar with what a duel is, or anyone present, a duel, uh, historically, was when if someone offended you, you could take your glove off and toss it at them and say, pistols at dawn. And to save face, you would have to go and you'd either hash it out there, away from the crowd that saw your conflict begin, uh, or if you couldn't, then you would walk X number of paces and pray that the engineers who built your pistol were really bad at their job or that the other person, this <laughs> engineer, was really bad at their job. <laughs> Duels became illegal in history in very much the same manner that becoming a martyr in the church became condemned. Too much senseless death. Too many people died at the stake uh, because of skirmishes that they began to prove that they were so faithful, and the church said, nope, that's too much pointless death, just to assure yourself that you'll go to heaven. And the government was like, this is too much pointless death just because you guys couldn't agree. Our modern society uh, has issues with getting offended. And we actually have lots of issues with senseless death and senseless violence. So me starting my sermon by talking about duels, I thought was quite bold and maybe ill thought. But if you've listened to the musical Broadway, which just came through the Midwest not that long ago, if you engaged in this political storytelling through engaging music and rhythm, if you've watched or heard Hamilton, you hear about three historic duels that all had very deadly consequences. But did you know that duels were not limited to men? No. Apparently, uh, women also participated in some very historic duels. In 1793, Two, a lady, Elmira Braddock, took offense at a comment that a Mrs. Elphinstone made about her age. According to some reports, Braddock claimed to not yet be 30, while Miss Elphinstone said she was actually more like 60. <sighs> Anyone wondered when women started being told not to put their real age on their driver's license? I'm guessing 1907, or 1792. 1792. So the women opted to resolve this fact uh, in Hyde Park at dawn. Both women fired their pistols but missed. And of course, the duel could have ended there, but no, they were committed. They had great follow through and they decided to hash it out with swords. And after receiving a, after receiving a wound on her arm, Elphinstone, uh, F, Elphinstone? I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying it right. She had to write a letter of apology for saying that the other gal looked like 60 instead of 30. I was like, that's just like an average day at our house trying to teach my kids how to tell numbers of progression. How old do you think I am? 87. <laughs> Close, that's a year I was born, but not yet. A <laughs> hundred years later, there was actually a duel between two women, a princess and a duchess. I believe it was in Germany, somewhere in Prussia. Uh, they had a duel because they disagreed over a flower arrangement at a musical event. Yeah. And to be fair, there are, we might think that those are ridiculous things to argue over. However, there were also historic notes of men dueling because they showed up to events wearing the same color cravat. I'm like, oh, so it wasn't just girls in the 90s who showed up to prom wearing the same dress when you would have these tussles, apparently. Men also fought over showing up to events in the same color, too. 
duels were a lot of senseless death over some valid arguments and a lot of unnecessary conflict and disagreements. And at this point, some of you are thinking, well, this is all very nice. It's a lovely history lesson, uh, but this is church and I came for a sermon. Uh, let me tell you, this faith that we have been given, this great cloud of witnesses that went through all of these hardships to ensure that we knew God's love and God's mercy and grace upon us, They had disagreements too. And it wasn't because it was human nature. I think our human nature is actually to avoid conflict. I think our human nature is to blend in and survive, but maybe that was just me in college. But we spend so much time, even in our modern day, falling into the same pitfalls that the biblical witnesses that have gone before us fell into. We hash them all out on social media now. But you have these modern day duels on social media. And if you're not on social media, bless you, my children, because that is a rabbit hole that is impossible to get out of. But maybe it's not social media. Maybe you've encountered conflict and division around the dinner table with family, or around a council table, or just in your car, trying to hash through something that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart. It is hard for us to hear the call of the Holy Spirit, to then become bold enough to take a stand for it, and then to encounter these words that Jesus had for us today. Jesus calls those who are faithful to him hypocrites. He's a little fed up. We've talked about maybe Jesus becoming hangry, but we also have Jesus being totally transparent and wanting to make sure that everyone is on the same page. You don't sign up to become a disciple of Christ a little bit like you're signing up for a timeshare, right? You kind of get, I've never actually convinced Logan to walk into those with me, but I am the target market. Boy, would they have me <laughs> if I was vacationing by myself. But Jesus doesn't bring people in and then you slowly get hooked and you slowly find out what all the hooks are to this event. Jesus is fully transparent right off the gate. You think this is for peace and for easy? No. I have come to redeem you, to resurrect you. You will encounter death. And the ways in which God's Holy Spirit calls upon your heart will not only cause you to repent and turn away from sin, but it will cause division between those you love who are also not willing to repent. Jesus gives us all the information up front. When you watch TV today, uh, I used to watch TV before my kids never fell asleep, but if you notice, people of faith are usually not represented very well. We are so easy um, to create conflict in either real life drama or in fictional stories. Now, somewhere in the last 10 years, I started paying attention for all the pastors in shows. And here's what I've learned. If you are a pastor in a movie, you are seen usually in one of two ways. You're either very manipulative, you're kind of cultish, or you are repressing yourself and everyone with these values. Now, Lutheranism is often not mentioned because Lutheranism would be terrible to form a cult. It's all about free grace, right? God's unconditional love, free grace, free mercy. You can't earn it. You can't guilt yourself into it. So I thought about this. I would not be able to become a cult leader because Lutheranism does not lend itself to being a cult. <laughs> but people of faith, faith leaders, are often portrayed in that manipulative, scary, trapped way. Or we're seen as Pollyannas, just like super, duper happy, optimistic, but like to the extreme. It's not just that we're optimistic and we see joy and everything. In the attempt to remain pure of heart, Somehow these characters have disconnected themselves from the painful and sinful world around them. They've become woefully inept stewards of those who are harmed and hurting. Either that, or you live in England in the 60s or an Anglican and you serve crime, like you solve crime. Any PBS, a third of the PBS shows I watch are pastors and priests solving murder. I'm like, 
I don't even have time to do my laundry. <laughs> like, it's unreal. I love those shows, though, but it is. I'm like, I just remind myself, like, am I feeling guilty today unnecessarily because Father Brown is so darn efficient? <laughs> but he also doesn't have a six year old and a three year old. Okay. Right? We are painted in these really broad stroke pictures because historically and in practical sense, church is a great place to experience conflict to encounter disagreement. We are really good at it, unfortunately. We're not good at resolving it. We're good at creating it and engaging in it. And so there is hope for us yet. As people of faith, we are encouraged to live alongside one another and encourage each other and receive encouragement, which means sometimes we're going to be cheerleaders for each other and we're going to show up and we're going to support each other for everything. And some days we're going to show up and convict each other to remind one another where we're trying to go in life, which is places of grace, contentment, mercy, hope. And we're going to try and make sure we're all getting there together. Like we're herding cats. We are a herd of cats. The Holy Spirit's just trying to get us there, and sometimes we need to leave each other. We're called to absolve each other when we are digging into those guilt trips unnecessarily. We are called to love one another. We are called to be God's image in the world. And somehow that is so super duper polarizing. The longer we follow God, somehow, the more polarizing we seem to become. To be a follower of Christ does not put you in some inner circle club, like when you're flying in the airports. Also, I've never experienced this. I've only ever seen this from the outside. But those of you who have flown like business class or pool and you get to go into those like little inner compartments where all the chairs are leather instead of that plastic. Yeah. I always thought the idea of it sounded cool, um, but becoming a follower of Christ isn't like that. Becoming a follower of Christ means that you're kind of out in the regular terminal area, you know, giving your seat up for other people or helping distract a mom whose toddlers are falling apart. When we went to Oregon, a young, here, a young couple was flying behind us for the first time with their six month old and I could see the fatigue in the way the parents were like rolling their neck. I don't even think I made eye contact with them. I'm like, oh, I have done that before when you're holding this bouncing baby for hours on a plane and they're just trying to hold it together. And I was like, may I? Thank you. And I took their baby. All right, we got this inner, inner awareness. They did let me take their baby. I offered, they realized I was serious. And then for an hour and a half, I just walked back and forth on the plane with their baby. I ran into some people from that plane several days later at the Devil's Punch Bowl, and they're like, where's your baby? I'm like, <laughs> it wasn't mine. <laughs> it was not my baby, right? A friend was also on that flight, and as we got, she's like, I, like when you said you liked kids, I didn't realize you really like kids. Like when I'm not around my children, I do not look for other times and opportunities to parent other people's kids, right? But that is, kind of what it's like. And you might not be kids, but something else. Like those of you who are good with numbers or you understand the foundations of buildings, like we share the things that are gifts of the Spirit with one another. And that's what we want. I mean, that's the best of being a church. And that's the part we lift up and we remind ourselves that that's what you get with becoming a child of God and a part of a community. Like we get to have fun together on Sunday morning. But then we also need to hold on to that when we encounter those areas of disagreement because the Holy Spirit has led one of us farther down this path and the rest of us are trying to get on it. We've got to rein each other back in and it's always a dance. C.S. Lewis has a great line in his book, Mere Christianity. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of pork would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly do not recommend Christianity. Which, the first time I heard that, in, high, in like late high school, early college, it was when I was a VBS camp leader. I'm like, uh, no, that's absolutely ridiculous. 
Because as a VBS leader, like your whole point is to show kids that there is love and there is joy. And it's not just this like painful, I have to try and sit still for an hour experience. But what you're getting is this this giant reminder of how loved and adored you are. And then I'd grown up and I loved lots of people. And I thought, oh my gosh, not only would Lutheranism be a terrible cult, but loving people is really hard. That like happy, clappy, snappy dance that I did for BBSers, which I still totally think is worthy for kids to encounter. We're giving everyone up front, this is the love, because they already know how hard it is. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. Bottle of court would do that. I went to religion for why? If you want to feel really comfortable, we don't recommend Christianity to feel comfortable, but then why do we recommend Christianity? I would say that we as Lutherans, we cling to our heritage, whether you grew up German Lutheran or Norwegian Lutheran or you know um, Tanzanian Lutheran, like you grow up Lutheran and you are bought into this heritage of God's love not being up for debate. It's not negotiable. God loves you so much that God would rather die than be parted from you. And then we have to train ourselves to be gracious recipients of grace. And we have to become our own cheerleaders and each other's cheerleaders to share it. Why do we recommend Christianity? It's so God can help us stay on the path of loving one another so we don't have to tear each other down. Because we totally do that. You could go to a Sunday matinee. You could be at State Fair right now. There's any countless places you could be. You could be stressed school shopping, which is exactly what I'm going to be doing later this week. Do you know how close back to school is? Figured it out last night. <laughs> went into deep breathing. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's two weeks before school start, which means in mom language, all of the notebooks are gone. All the pencil sharpeners are wiped out. You think there's times like, oh no, no, the time has already, the time has already been lost. We are, this is going to be slim pickings when we go back to school shopping this week. There's any countless things you could be doing for your comfort, for your pure enjoyment. We come to these places of sanctuary, either for worship for confession or for meditation, to do something different. We come here to boldly trust in that love, to not just gain self-awareness, but to be transformed. We come to be resurrected. At some point in this week, you did something stupid, like putting your wallet in the fridge. And we have family in town, and so I bought nine bags of shrimp, because I'm like, shrimp oil, everyone's just going to get mercury poisoning. <laughs> And my wallet ended up in the fridge, and I wasted half a day looking for it. <laughs> I didn't even told Logan. The only reason I told that story right here is because he's still hosting our company. And you just need to feel resurrected. Like, that was embarrassing. It was a waste of time. But Jesus still loves me. I can still contribute to the world. Or you've encountered some fact. Um, one of the reasons we're addicted to social media isn't just because we're nosy, although sometimes we are. It's because we get we get dopamine highs from gaining information. So when you see your grandkids or your children or your spouse scrolling through Instagram, lots of people are giving you tutorials there. And we learn something that makes us feel good. It's like, oh, dopamine, and then you keep scrolling for three hours. I'm like, boy, I gotta, I gotta start teaching stuff in my sermon so people get dopamine highs and keep coming back to church. <laughs> we get addicted to these things. There are so many things to entertain you in the world. You don't even have to leave your house. We come here to do something different. You've encountered something in the week that made you feel stupid. You learn something in the world that has changed a previous um, foundational thought that you had. We come to these places to have our faith ignited, to be reminded that yes, these things in your life are killing you. But God is resurrecting you every day. He's resurrecting you today. He's going to resurrect you, resurrect you tomorrow. And Jesus is going to resurrect you on that final day. We have come here to have our ignorance replaced with conviction. We have come here to hear God's word and be made more resilient so we can console one another more effectively. We've come here to have our prejudice replaced with compassion. 
Another quote that I found, and I have no idea who said it. Those who are faithful only know the trivial side of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. Those who are faithful only know the trivial side of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. Jesus calls all sorts of people. I mean, think of those disciples. We don't, they're not even named. And they followed him to this place, and he's giving them all the information they need. Like, this isn't just about peace. This is about eternal life. This is about salvation. This is about redemption and resurrection. Yes, it is going to be hard. But the other side of that, so even though Jesus called them hypocrites, and when we read ourselves into that spot, when Jesus calls us hypocrites, Jesus didn't give up on those hypocrites. Jesus doesn't even give up on the faithless. Jesus reminds people, I have come here for baptism. Love for it to be over. I would love for it to be over, but I am here for a baptism and a purpose. And I will accomplish what it is because God, the Father, has made promises to you. And as God, the Son, I am here to fulfill those. Being alive means you will encounter hardships. Being a child of God means that Christ is always going to be faithful to you no matter those tragedies. On those joyful days when you are so filled with faith that you don't have to think about the nitty and gritty part of it, and on those days when you feel faithless and you know the real tragedies of living in a world without love, the promise of the cross is worth encountering death for. Because the promise of resurrection has already been set in your heart. The promise of the cross is worth encountering death for because resurrection always comes next. Jesus desires that we are more mindful of what we're signing up for. Jesus is desiring that we love each other even when we don't do it very well. Jesus is desiring of us giving ourselves grace and one another grace. God is a God of reconciliation. And if you close your eyes, and I will ask you because I do think we come up with more honest examples when we do close our eyes, think of something that you find irredeemable. It's going to be a painful one. You probably are going to go someplace really painful. Think of something that you think is irredeemable. You know the pain of being without faith. Now remember, Jesus came for a baptism and a promise. And you reside securely in that baptism and that promise. It is redeemable. Maybe not redeemable by you, but it is redeemable by God. And that's where the church is so good at division. Because there are pains we encounter in this world. I don't want them to be redeemed. I want you to be in trouble. That hurt. That was unforgivable. And yet, God never abandons what God created. And so it's okay to sometimes say, I can't be the one to redeem that. But I can trust in God's love well enough to work through that division and that conflict and allow God to work resurrection. As much as we try to not turn our faith or our worshiping patterns or our preferred expressions of faith into these battlegrounds we do. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is actually living in your lives and making you passionate about things. And when you are passionate about something, you encounter as many people who are for it as they are against it. You don't do your life without faith. Anything you are passionate about, your faith comes along with you. Whether it's going to the grocery store, going to the voting polls, you know, buying a house, buying a car, serving at the soup kitchen, being on church council, helping a stranger in need. You don't separate your faith from that. It's just there with all of it. You encounter everyone who agrees with you, and your faith is there. You encounter people who disagree with you, and your faith is there. It's not just that you're 100% sinner or 100% percent—you know, just one or the other, sinner or saint, but you're 100% both at the same time. It's not just that we are dying or we're living. It's you're always dying and you're constantly being raised to new life. 
So I'm not a baby pastor anymore. I have been told this by my colleagues. I'm not a baby pastor anymore. But I do think I'm still maybe a toddler pastor, right? So I'm going to open up this conversation about the places in which Jesus, who reminds us that following him will create division. Not because we're vindictive or cruel, but because if we're actually following Christ and passionate about God's word in our life, we're going to encounter people who disagree. So this is not the end of a conversation, just like confirmation is at the end of a process. We're opening up a new way to talk to each other. In what ways have you followed Christ and encountered conflict or division? Hear this good news. Jesus did not give up on the hypocrites of his day or the faithless of his time. And so Christ is not going to give up on the hypocrites that we are today or the faithless that are in this age. Jesus did not come to give us a baptism with catches and hooks and loopholes. Jesus came to give us a promise that is foolproof and never-ending. So trust in what the cross and that baptism promises. Let your confidence in the redemption and the grace and this cloud of witnesses that surround us help carry you through those divisive relationships and those places of conflict. Do not lose heart. Love has not given up on you and to God never will. And for this news, we give thanks and we say amen. I invite you to sing with me as you are able. Our hymn of the day, Abide With Me. Uh, we're going to sing all the verses. Uh, so please feel free to stand or sit as you um, are able to listen to your body. And stand if you're able or seat, uh, stay seated if you need to. 629.
Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your church. We pray for all who dedicate their lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our siblings in faith around the globe, and bless the work of our ecumenical and interfaith partners. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters. Transform the devastation of floods and fires into fertile ground for new life and growth. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Merciful God, receive, receive our prayer. prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain the nations. We pray for all elected officials. Kindle in them a desire to administer your justice. Strengthen their resolve to defend those who are vulnerable and to stand publicly against all forms of oppression. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain those who are oppressed. We pray for people harmed by racist discrimination, ableist discrimination, and all people discriminated against based on their gender or orientation. Rescue us from all systems that degrade our fellow human beings, and God save us from the times when we discriminate or degrade ourselves. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O oh God, and sustain this assembly. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. In our joy and in our tears, be near us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we remember the saints who have gone before us. May we run with perseverance the race set before us until we find our rest in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. At this time, I invite you, as you and your household are able, to please share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you. Peace be with you, those who are worshiping with us. Peace be with you, those
you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field, and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right. Our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. So with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we join their hymn, or we join their unending hymn. <laughs> Thanks, Christ. 
Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged your wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And way, as way of announcements uh, today, because it is state fair time, I invite you to have some special petitions this year, not just for safe travel, but for all the 4-Hers who are there um, leading their cattle or baking their goods. Uh, I was reminded just recently just how intense of a time of the year it is for our youth. Um, and especially we're praying for those 4 Hers who did not make it to state fair. It's a week, uh, which several weeks here, just full of a lot of emotions. So uh, pray for kids as they display the hard work that they did this summer. Um, pray for validation and affirmation for those who do not get to show their work this year. And then just pray for all the kids going back to school. We've got not that much time left this summer. Um, so connect with your inner child and pray with them. And for them. Any other announcements? Yes, Ben. I have one. Um, our daughter Natalie had her PET scan Wednesday of last week, and the results of the PET scan shows there's no cancer anywhere in the body. So praise God. Oh, we're going to do a special prayer just for that. Let's pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you for all the ways you manifest and show yourself uh, when we get bad news, but today we give thanks for good news. Um, continue to bless Natalie uh, and her family and to make her good news um, help give our hearts joy for all of those um, that we are loving and walking alongside who may get hard news or have received hard news in the last couple of days. Thank you, God, um, for all you do uh, and for this assembly that we may pray for her and support her with this good news. And in your name we pray. Amen. Yay. We often pray for lots of things. But it's always nice to have those surprise announcement ones. So thank you. Yes. Uh, today's the last day to sign up if you want a package with Kids Against Hunger next Saturday at the Way Church. So yes. Uh, we're, which, at, we're at 10 o'clock. Our team will be at 10 o'clock. That's exactly what I was going to ask. 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, the girls may be making a guest appearance early in their princess <laughs> outfits before we go to the zoo. So they're just going to crash whoever has the earlier sessions. Um, but it's such a wonderful um, ministry to be a part of. So come help us pack for uh, Takeaway Hunger. And uh, it's game day too. So if you or if you didn't have plans or if your plans need to change for this afternoon, you can come play games. It's a good time. With that, you've been standing <laughs> plenty long. Not that you earned this blessing, but thank you. Please receive a blessing. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. We will sing our sending hymn. 884.